Okay, um, so today we will just um, talk about, first of all, how the class itself is. Hopefully you watched the video, but if you didn't, um, that's another place you can learn it. And in addition to that, if you have any questions, you can ask them as we go along and clarify stuff because there's always issues. Um, as long as we stay on the internet, there's always some issues with how everything works and so on. Even without the internet, there are plenty of issues, but with internet, it's even worse. Okay, so um, let me go through this um, PowerPoint. I am adjusting them every time. So you guys in section 3001, and that's the only section now which has this um, live sessions. And they will be running like regular classes twice a week between 2 to um, 3.20 p.m. on Mondays and Wednesdays. They are phasing them out because I know that last semester I taught five of them and believe me, this is not fun. Um, I love teaching in class. It's actually wonderful, but doing that stuff online for um, four or five hours a day is very exhaustive and um, probably not fun for you too because unfortunately that doesn't have this kind of a direct communication which you can have in a classroom. Hopefully, there's a big hope, but next semester will be different. Yes, good afternoon everybody. Hopefully, that's the hope, but uh, we don't know that yet. As of right now, um, we are preparing for the worst case scenario which is still online. But um, obviously that will all depend on the situation. And um, nobody knows what situation will be like by the end of August. Right now the hope is that it will be all behind us or at least most of it and we'll be able to go back to the classroom perhaps after vaccinating or something. Yeah, we will talk about the book in a second. Um, the book should be the same. The, let's, let's go over the slides. It's on the slides. So first of all, the outline of the grade, like I talked to, to you guys on the video. Let me explain it one more time. The grade for this class has four components. Um, homework and quizzes on MindTab, they are kind of all together. It'll be one grade for all of them, just the average of everything. Uh, but of course, they graded separately on MindTab. They just transferred to Canvas as one big grade. The other three quarters of the grade three exams, which you will see, we have a slide with the uh, dates and everything. Each one is 25%. So this is 100%, right? But there is also going to be extra credit for attendance and participation in these uh, live sessions in your case, which will be on top of that and it can add up to 10% to your final result. Um, so if you regularly attend and participate and so on, you may get as much as 10% bump, which is quite a lot, right? So for example, if your total is 85%, in that case, it will go to 95%. But naturally not everybody will get it, only the students who do uh, persistently um, participate well, be careful with Amazon because uh, one of the things, like several students asked me already, if you go to CSN bookstore, they have all the correct choices. I know that because this is what we got from the publisher and we passed it on to them. And so this is verified. Every other source is not really verified. Um, you may get it cheaper somewhere. You may get it in a variety of different ways but um, you may also get something which you do not need. You may overpay or you may even like get completely wrong material. So be careful. Amazon in particular, when they sell stuff without um, access codes, they don't guarantee any access code. So there may be either old access code, used one or no access code at all. An access code is actually what you need. That is the main thing because the physical book I don't require at all. Uh, the physical hard copy of the book, you don't have to have it. Okay, um, so let's move on here. The book, 
again you know it's on syllabus and so on please download the syllabus by the way um, there's all the important information very often students don't do it for some reason and then ask me questions which syllabus actually uh, explained so socio douglas archetypes of wisdom and introduction to philosophy ninth edition however like i said i do not actually require you to have the physical book now mind tap itself this book is published by sengage so sengage runs mind tap that is what you require to have um, all the homework will be on MindTap, quizzes on MindTap, and the book, the electronic copy of the book, is on MindTap. Now, as far as I know, and I don't know all the prices exactly because nobody actually tells me prices, but I heard from students that the cheapest option is $70. Now, that should cover everything you need. They have all sorts of fancy stuff which you can add on top of that, but you don't require that. Even the cheapest option should definitely have the book, electronic book, and homeworks. That should be in every option. If option doesn't have it, that probably is some sort of a scam or something, because that should be there. Uh, I checked it with publishers before. They said the book is always included. There is no option which only has homework and no book. Every single option they sell has both electronic book and the uh, homeworks and this is the minimum requirement but some students prefer to have a physical book for their study habits and so on if you want to you can buy a more expensive package which includes the physical book what do you mean it didn't show access to mind tab how, how did what did it sell it to you then the uh, only thing there should be access to MindTap. Everything is on MindTap, right? So if you paid $70 and you don't have access to MindTap, then I'm not sure what exactly did you buy. Um, and again, the best way to go is through CSN Bookstore. Um, if you bought it on Amazon or something, I have no idea what it is. Bookstore should definitely have it. Bookstore has two options there. Um, one of them is just the access code they i don't know how they generate it now but if you purchase it online they'll probably email it to you or something and that is what uh, will basically cover the mind tap access the other option is loose leaf edition of the book with the access code and that one um, they'll probably mail to you the loose leaf but again you should get the access code somehow from them either through email or by some other means uh, yeah, the location could make a difference because note that this uh, web remote classes, they do have location attached. So sometimes you have to make sure that the bookstore location online, even though it is online, is the correct one. Uh, I don't know how they do it um, for the fully online classes. But if you have any questions, again, you can... Uh, ask the bookstore they have communication there they can answer you too because um, you have to remember i am just teaching this class i'm not selling any books right um so i know students always ask me all this stuff but i'm sorry like many of these questions i i don't really know all i know is that i pass it on to the bookstore and they're supposed to sort it out um, i am not really familiar with the prices or with the specifics but the best place to buy should be the Swiss CSN bookstore because they are verified and they know exactly what is needed for the class. Another option is right there online, but make sure you actually sign in through uh, the link on the Canvas. You should be in Canvas and then you go to Assignments and click on that link. Well, that is probably what it is seventy dollars yes for the course and it should include everything if you go through again uh, through the canvas they know what section you are in now sometimes students just google it or something and they get all sorts of other stuff which uh, may not even again be necessary or may not even be applicable to this class because sengage uh, sells all sorts of other material 
on their website you can find amazing stuff uh, they have some subscriptions for like six months for all the courses which obviously are more expensive they have variety of other options so all this stuff I, I'm not even qualified to explain to you what it is because again I'm not selling any of it right uh, it is um, the publisher Sengage who sells this stuff so you have to like um, use your best judgment if you want to buy it anywhere other than CSN bookstore make sure that you are paying for the right thing um, $70 should be enough from what I hear uh, you can also yes use the chat and uh, get in touch with other students because again that the problem for me is I don't buy it even one time um, when I sign in I have a different screen and I have different options so I can only rely again on the experience of you guys when you tell me oh this is what's going on and um, I don't run this website and I have no access to anything other than you know user interface just like you only from the slightly different side so again for me that's very difficult to give you good advice about uh, how exactly to buy it and so on but CSN bookstore should um, have all the correct information okay so hopefully um, that part right now is more or less clear well it should include the access to online homework platform this is um, should be part of it again in that case just go with CSN bookstore CSN bookstore should have uh, only the correct options they do not sell anything other than that but um, if you are doing it online well but it is amazing how can they possibly not have uh, homework there then what do they exactly have just the book but it, it's all integrated MindTap is an integration of the videos homework and everything it's like in one place how can they uh, ban you from it but another thing is remember first two weeks are free if you sign up right now you don't have to pay anything so maybe the good strategy is to sign up and then figure it out um, see what other people are saying see what other options are there don't rush with the just paying them right away um, maybe you are better off waiting a few days at least first two weeks they do not require any payment from you okay the total number of homeworks and quizzes will be 15 and we will talk in the end about um, the one for which is due this Sunday for this week but just in general so 15 homeworks 15 quizzes um, they are all already there that is again 25% of your grade so you absolutely have to do it they always are due on Sunday so always on Sunday at 11 59 p.m. that's the midnight between Sunday and Monday right do not wait for the last moment it often happens that students think oh I'll do it like an hour before and then they have no internet or something else happens so you can do it during the entire week you can do it on Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday whatever day and it's best to do it before Sunday if you wait till Sunday then definitely do it in the morning do not wait for the Sunday evening they don't have time limit they have three tries um, wait it's an average grade I think and um, they are graded when it is submitted have to double check because they the setting could be a little different but um, there should be three tries and they are not timed however you get different questions next time so they kind of change them a little bit so that you would not have exactly the same answers as far as I understand because um, again I obviously I don't really do it myself I can only see what it looks like and um, what they tell me okay uh, some other stuff so this is how it should look like let me explain a couple of things here so that you guys could understand it a little bit better so note that you can switch the view between right here that's what you will see between the calendar view and the chapter view 
and it's best to go with um, the um, calendar view. Calendar view will give you, you see the date, for example, this is how it would, should look like right now. Week one, 19th through 24th, right? So on the 24th, which is Sunday at 11.59 p.m., this is what is due. The ones with red dot are the ones which is part of your grade. The rest, readings and stuff, they are not graded. So I do, of course, want you to do it. But obviously, the fact that you read the book doesn't, you can't really grade it very much. Uh, but this is like part of the process, right? So the readings are also due on particular dates. Well, this, you should see it differently than me. This is actually what I see right now this morning about people who already did the uh, homework. This is the average of the class, right? You obviously not going to see the average of the class. You'll probably see your own average. Well, Abigail, I, I really am not qualified to tell you about the prices, right? Um, I don't want to mislead you in any way. It's, uh, I, maybe you should get in touch with Sengage or with the bookstore. I, like, I don't want to tell you something which um, is not true. I, I don't know how they price it and what are the packages specifically. Um, sorry. Okay, so let me um, show you what else is here. This is where you can see the entire book. If you want to see the entire book, this is a useful link. You click on it, it opens the entire book. Otherwise, obviously, if you click on chapters, it will open the chapter in the book, which is supposed to be there. Um, if you click on homework, it opens homework. So again, the calendar view is probably the best, but if you switch it back to chapter view, this is the chapter view, then it will just show you introduction, chapter this, chapter that. That may be a little confusing in terms of what is due on what week. Uh, so I would prefer to look at it from the calendar view, but it's up to you. You can switch between them back and forth. That's an option too. Uh, and hopefully here you can see your own grade. I don't know because again, from my side, I can only see class average since I'm not doing homeworks, but you should see it a little bit differently. Okay. Um, let's see. So it is completely free until February 2nd. Uh, so you can do it for two weeks. The first homeworks this week, this Sunday and the next Sunday should be included. But by this date, you do have to arrange some sort of payment, either through bookstore or directly to them. And yes, guys, by all means, if you have your own experience, please share with others. Because like I said, I, I, I can't do it. I can't go there and buy that stuff because you know, obviously that would be a waste of money for me. But um, the, the, you are the ones who go through this experience yourself. All I know is what publishers tell me and publishers just tell me this is the ISBN codes which I should pass on to the bookstore. That's pretty much the extent of my knowledge of the subject. So I'm sorry, but um, that, that, there's not much more I can tell you about these details. Um, okay, so online there should be an option to pay online. If you are already registered and everything, hopefully that's the correct option. But the bookstore is the best place because the bookstore has the uh, correct codes. And if you get in financial aid, if it covers the books, then you definitely want to go through the bookstore. Okay, uh, hopefully that more or less clarifies it. And like I said, wait a little bit um, if you are unsure. Don't rush with this stuff. You have two free weeks. There's no reason to rush. I don't want you to make mistake. I do sometimes get um, messages from students after they already purchased something telling me, oh my God, I purchased the wrong thing. And you know, there's nothing I can do. I cannot refund you money or anything, right? So just uh, approach it carefully. Okay, now a um, few words about the exam. So there will be three exams, right? 
Uh, each one will have 30 questions. In fact, um, for the first exam, there is already a review which I uploaded. This is the way it looks when it's printed out. And that review gives you uh, more questions than will be on the actual exam. It has 45 questions. The exam will have only 30 questions. So they will come from that selection now. So you should know questions, to answers to all of them. What I would do is I would also print it and have it ready for each session because we're going through the subjects which cover all these questions, right? So in the end of the day, you have like mini review every single class. And then once we make it to the exam, you already know all the correct answers. You may want to write them down or something. But uh, of course, if you wait for the last moment, then you have a lot to cover in like small period of time, which is not impossible, but why would you want to do it in this way? I don't know. Um, and it will be, each one will be 25% of your grade. Um, all exams are on Canvas. They are multiple choice. Um, after each question, you have several options. They are timed at 45 minutes. Now the exams, unlike homework, do have a time limit, 45 minutes. That should be plenty of time. And the reason I don't want it to be unlimited or anything is because I actually want you to know this stuff and be ready rather than, you know, open the exam and then slowly look up all the correct answers, which obviously defeats the purpose. Uh, ideally, you should know the correct answers before you even start the exam. So for this reason, it is timed after 45 minutes. If you not finish the times out for 30 questions, it should be plenty multiple choice in classroom. And I used to give it in classroom students typically are done in about 20 minutes. Um, why? Well, because they're not looking it up, right? But like I said, I don't even want you to look it up. Uh, that even though I cannot control that, but that definitely is not uh, how exams should be. Okay, um, the questions will be based on our discussions. They will be based on um, the lectures. So the book, some of them do kind of coincide with the book because it's the same material, but some of them may be completely different. They may not be in the book at all. So in order for you to do well on the exams, you actually have to attend uh, these lectures or at least watch them later. And that's the only way to do well on the exams. On the other hand, the homeworks are completely based on the book because um, they come from MindTap as well, that same publisher. So they are very closely related to what is in the book. Once you read the chapter in the book, you should know the answers for the homework. The homework is not really that difficult. Uh, although there's also quizzes, they are maybe a little more challenging. But again, if you read the chapter, you should be able to do both uh, very well. Typically, students have no problem with that. Uh, if you noticed, the average right now is already like 98%. Um, this is not many people took it, but the ones who took it did very well. And it generally should not be uh, very difficult. Okay. Um, attendance and participation. Well, since you do have these sessions, I'm assuming that you obviously do need to be present in class. Um, otherwise, it was easier for you to sign up for the um, sessions which don't have any live sessions classes which don't have any live sessions. So, of course, you should come, but it's not part of the grade. Note that the grade mm -hmm. is only three exams and the homework, homework and quizzes. Uh, the grade itself can be accomplished without any attendance and participation. However, this is for your benefit to uh, help you to learn the material. And so I do give extra credit uh, periodically, take names of students who are answering questions and participating well. Occasionally, if there is very low attendance around holidays, usually I may even give extra credit to everyone who shows up. That does happen not very often, but it does. If I see very few students um, come to class, I sometimes just take everybody's name and uh, give everybody extra credit for that. So it definitely pays to attend and to participate. Um, and one more thing I wanted to say, I just I was just grading uh, my classes in December and it was um, rather painful 
And the reason is, now that all these classes are online, um, it's harder for students to concentrate, and I know this. So when you go um, to school, to the building, right, you are somewhat more uh, prepared to do well in class. You are attending those lectures, you are there, and so on. When you are online, it's so easy to just, you know, drift. Your attention drifts to other things. It's easy not to attend. Um, there's all sorts of distractions. And then students just end up failing classes. Um, there were a lot more students doing badly in classes um, last semester than like ever before. And then they get mad and they blame me for it. But guys, there's only so much I can do, right? I um, try my best to explain this to you, but if you don't even listen, if you don't attend, what can I do? You still have to do the work. The work is on you. Uh, there's no way I can just shove it into your mind somehow um, through some magic. There's no magic here. You really have to do the work. Um, but in the end of the day, it is my job to evaluate how well did you do the work and to give you the grade which reflects it. And so then students get uh, mad and um, they think it's unfair that they get lower grade than they think they deserve. But if I look at the results, um, that's, that's what it is, right? And sometimes there can be even like borderline cases when, um, for example, well, I can give you one example. I had a student um, last semester telling me she was on, uh, what is it, 89, I think, percent, right, between uh, B plus and um, A minus. So she was trying to argue to me that she should get A minus. Well, what I do in cases like this, well, I looked at her attendance and participation. How well did she do in class? And I turned out that she barely ever attended. She barely did anything there. So just on the percentages, she does have 89%. But is there any effort involved? Barely anything, right? So I told her, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to give you A-. minus. I don't think you deserve it. That is as simple as that. Because another thing, though, um, and many of you not even be able, uh, not even be aware of that, everything you do online is instantly registered. I can pull up information and see which dates did you attend, uh, which classes did you attend, what did you download. Everything is there because unlike in the classroom here, once you are in Canvas, Canvas traces every step you take. How long do you spend on Canvas? What do you download and so on? And I get access to all this stuff. So I can immediately see whether the student was actually trying hard or whether the students like barely did anything. And that can make a difference for the grade too. Because it is still classes in college. It's not some sort of fun we are having here. Even though hopefully we will have some fun, but in the end of the day, if you want to get a good grade, you should really put an effort into it. And um, like I said, make sure you discipline yourself and actually attend the sessions and do the work. Otherwise, it shouldn't be very difficult, but you really have to put some effort into it. Uh, yeah. I hate it too. That, don't get me wrong. I realize it's difficult for everybody. It's difficult for me to teach it this way. It's difficult for you guys to concentrate. Well, what can we do, right? Hopefully it'll be better next um, semester. But for now, we have to do our best with what we have. And this is what we have. Okay, uh, let's see what else is here. So this is the uh, class as it looks on the syllabus. Let me explain to you a little bit the dates. So see the dates are here, right? So today is January 20th. This is what book reading you should do by today's session. Hopefully you read the introduction. I realize maybe for some of you it is a little too soon, but ideally you should have been done with the introduction. Note that obviously you're not losing any points if you didn't do it, but it's just um, something which I would like for you to do. For January 25th, which is Monday, again, you really should do this chapter 2. And um, the reading for chapter 2 is, again, on MindTap. You can do it at any time, but you should have it completed by the time we meet on January 25th. And for those uh, students who take it online completely, well, again, they should really try to do it before uh, January 25th or at the latest in the morning of 25th. It's not going to disappear on the 25th, unlike homework, uh, but 
um, the, the due date there is just meant to remind you that you are supposed to finish it at some point before then. And for every single day we have that. So note that for some days, for example, on the 27th next Wednesday, there is no reading. Why? Well, because chapter 2 actually covers both of these classes. Uh, now let's look at homework and quizzes. This is where I put in red the due dates. And again, you don't have to wait for the due date. You can do it before the due date, but you nonetheless have to do it. So the introduction, there's actually two homeworks this week, not one. There's introduction to Aplia and there's introduction to um, philosophy. Both of them are introduction. One of them just explains to you how to use uh, MindTap, the Aplia and all this um, stuff there. So it's more of a kind of a helpful than anything. And the other one is introduction to philosophy, which is based on that reading, on the introduction reading. Both of them are due on Sunday, January 24th at 11.59 p.m., one minute before midnight. All homeworks are always due on Sunday and quizzes. There will be quizzes starting from chapter two. There's no quiz this week. Yes, I'm referring to the Sandgate program you have to buy. Um, this is like I said before, this is where the book is, this is where the homework is, this is where everything is. So this is the due dates. Eve, what happens if you miss the due date? You get zero on that homework and you get zero on this quiz and your total average goes down. Uh, I do not allow extensions because I did at some point and what happens is students think, okay, I don't have to do it by the deadline, so I'll do it later. And then they don't do it later and then it accumulates and then they ask me to open up like 15 homeworks for them and that just snowballs into insanity. So no more extensions, period. Uh, make sure you do it on time or you will get a zero. That's just how it works. Uh, there's plenty of time to do that. Okay, um, so hopefully that part is clear. So this is the exam dates. First exam, March 1st. So how is exam going to work? It will open at midnight between uh, February 28th and March 1st. It will be open to you the entire day until midnight, March 1st to March 2nd. You can take it anytime you want, but you will only have 45 minutes. So if you start it at say 5 a.m., I don't know, some people prefer to do it early, be my guest. If you start it at like 1 p.m., be my guest throughout the entire day. However, if you again miss the deadline, it will still be available next day because I know there's always students who miss it, but it will incur 10% penalty for late submission. So if you do it on March 2nd, you will get 10% deducted. Do not miss the deadline. And again, the reason is because you guys, you know, if you uh, have any time you want, you may want to take it a month later, but it has to be already completed so that we could move on. Okay, uh, the second exam is April 12th. That's after the uh, spring break. Spring break is like somewhere in here between these two dates. Same thing as with the first one. And then final exam is on May 10th. That's the last week of classes, Monday on the last week of classes. Same thing again, it will open at midnight. Same thing again, it will run until the following midnight. And again, you will have an extra day with 10% penalty. Now that one will be kind of cumulative. What does it mean? Well, there is 45 questions uh, review for this one. There's 45 questions review for this one. So some of the questions on the final will just come from these two reviews. So if you prepare for these two and you know the material, well, hardly will take any work for you to prepare for about half of the final. If you don't, you will have to go back and cover the entire thing. So that may get more complicated. So don't, uh, miss any of it here okay and this is like i said in terms of the grade that is all the stuff we have um, now let's talk a little bit about philosophy well is there any questions anybody want to ask anything before we get into philosophy is it clear
Okay, so you can always message me and I try to answer everybody as soon as I can. Um, sometimes I don't have an answer. Like I said, just want to repeat one more time. Remember guys, I don't publish the book. I don't sell the book. Um, I assign it because we have to assign um, material. That's college requirement. I select the book, but uh, when it comes to payments and stuff like this, unfortunately, I'm not an expert. We will be having, uh, well, the discussion itself will go um, similar to today. At the beginning, I will again go over the material and then we will have some uh, questions and so on. Um, stuff mainly from the book, you will see. So it's kind of like a combination of me talking and then maybe hopefully you talking and so on. Um, the, the, yeah, the review is already there. It's on files, go to files. You will see it's called um, review one. That's the review for the first exam. It, when you print it, it looks like this. It just has a bunch of questions and you will see that each time we cover like three, four questions. Sometimes maybe a little more. Um, Aristotle, unfortunately, like we only have one session, but uh, there are quite a few questions on Aristotle, but I will try to cover all of them in one day, or maybe I'll put additional video myself. But all the questions will be covered, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it is on Canvas, on Canvas C tab called Files. That is where you will find, uh, well, first of all, course syllabus, and second of all, the review. I may even send a message later with review attached, but for now it's already there. If you want to download it, it's there. Okay, so philosophy. Uh, this is also what the book talks about. Define the term philosophy is one of the first learning objectives. So what is philosophy? What are we going to be doing in this class? Uh, philosophy comes from a Greek. And I did kind of talk about it a little bit in the video too. Um, Greek word philia means love and sophia means wisdom. Uh, but there is a difference between when people say, oh, it's so philosophical or I'm doing philosophical stuff uh, and actual discipline of philosophy. And the difference is it is more systematic and it is rational approach based on reasoning, which is also why uh, philosophy 102 is philosophy. Now, I know some of you guys already took philosophy 102 with me or maybe with somebody else. And often students even wonder, how is it philosophy? Well, because this is where the whole thing started. The logical th reasoning, uh, critical thinking, critical thinking skills, not just, you know, sitting there with, I don't know, uh, marijuana or something and wondering, oh, what's this all about? But a rigorous approach and using strict rules of reasoning, logical rules, trying to figure out things um, for which science today does not really give us any answers. And at the beginning, when you go back to ancient Greece, there was no distinction between science and philosophy. Philosophy was the science. It's where the science began. And for many, many centuries, that was the case. Uh, the questions, however, were generally on all sorts of uh, subjects. So, okay, uh, like I said, this is what we're going to be doing periodically. So now, guys, you can um, say a few things so it wouldn't be just me talking. Now, reflect on your education up to this point. Hopefully you did have some education. In what ways has it hindered and in what ways has it supported a love of wisdom, do you think? If anybody wants to talk about it, um, I guess if you want to actually turn on your microphone or whatever, that's fine. Or if you just want to type it, that's fine too. What do you think? Education. Did it help? Did it make you uh, succeed in terms of um, love of wisdom? Okay, Abigail, thanks. Yes. Uh, in what way? So in terms of love of wisdom, a lot of people today you know, look at education as a tool to make money. That, that is a very typical approach and I often see in discussions when people are saying, oh, he got such use, useless education, he can't even get a good job. 
Uh, do you think education should be primarily in order to get a job? No, I don't think so. It depends on the situation and what kind of job you're getting. Well, we all get in some kind of jobs, right? But I mean, the purpose of education. Mm. Well, note that there are different types of education, right? Um, it's not so much of the type of a job, it's a type of education. Obviously, if you are getting into professional school, such as law school, for example, well, that, that is meant primarily for you to get a job as a lawyer, right? But... Um, if you study philosophy, that's not really in order for you to get a job as a philosopher, right? Uh, and even though not many students as they uh, major in philosophy, but still some do. And they, if you major in philosophy, you probably are not thinking of a job as a philosopher, right? But what is the purpose of that? If they have money to pay for it, then they should get it. What well, do you think education should be free? You don't think so? Madison makes a good point, but note that also, um, this is how it is in school, right? Uh, most people, especially like after high school, are um, going to college and um, some of them fail for this very reason. I know that um, students think, oh, professor just have to like somehow force me to uh, know things. It's his job to teach me. And in college, the approach is generally different. Note that CSN is kind of in between a little bit because um, it depends on the college. But if you uh, go for UNLV, you will see even more uh, of kind of an approach when professor just goes, gives you a lecture and that's it. Many of them give lectures to like 100 150 students and they don't know all the students they don't follow all the students they don't know if the students fail in the class or not they just give the material and it's up to you to take it so the approach is completely different from school whereas in school um, teachers actually try very hard to make sure you do not fail in college very often um, professors don't care um, why don't they care well one thing many students don't realize is in the university especially such as UNLV what is the primary job of a university professor you may to think instruct you. Huh? to instruct you no what is what, what is he supposed to do what is the he's evaluated um, his job is evaluated over okay let me tell you research they are doing research. It's a research university. They should publish papers and do research. This is their primary job. Teaching is actually a side job. It's an addition to that. It's not their main job because university is a research university and it should conduct research. Um, so this is where students kind of don't understand what is going on because they're thinking the professors are there to teach them. The professors are thinking we're here to do research. We're not here to teach anybody. We do teach people because, you know, that's part of our contract, but that's not our main uh, job. So that obviously creates um, a disconnect when students expect something, but it's not really there. At CSN, we do more um, of kind of a hands-on approach. Why? Because, well, for one thing, we don't do research. CSN and most colleges are actually not a research institution, unlike university. University is a research institution. College is not. So colleges, including liberal arts colleges, are just specifically meant to teach. And so for this reason, here you get more attention from instructors compared to a university. The bigger the university, the less attention you will probably get because they have very huge classes. If by some chance, for example, um, you get into Harvard or something, you will notice that professors there, they're world class, right? They don't care at all because, again, their job is they write books, they do research, they give all sorts of um, paid um, conferences and so on. Um, students for them... It's just a very, very small part of 
their work. And they will come and give you a lecture and then they don't even know your name. Because why should they? So there is a very big difference here. Uh, but nonetheless, in terms of the wisdom, let me see what you guys are saying. I took a psych class last semester and I didn't really have any expectations because I'm a nursing major and it was just a prerequisite, but it was really cool walking out of it to have a better understanding of people and why people respond and react to certain ways um, and just kind of communicating a lot better, I guess. So I was pretty thankful for walking away with better wisdom and people after that class. Yes, hopefully that is what you will get from this class too. Not necessarily people, although, by the way, um, psychology majors I know are required to take philosophy 101 and you will see why, because it is uh, closely related. We will talk a lot about uh, stuff which generally is considered to be part of psychology, such as um, how do we know things, how do we learn things, and so on. This is where it all begins. Psychology is fairly recent discipline. It's what 19th century when the first uh, psychologists uh, appeared, but philosophy has been there for thousands of years, which is again what we will be talking about on Monday. We'll go all the way back. But nonetheless, um, the subject is very similar. And the idea is people wanted to learn stuff about themselves and the world around them. That is why it is a love of wisdom. People realized that prior to that, their main occupation was to survive, right? Uh, you hunt the bisons, you grow crops, whatever. You do the work. But at some point, some people, and Aristotle actually suggests that those were the people, uh, probably wealthy people, who had plenty of free time on their hands, they started wondering about other stuff. Uh, asking these kind of philosophical questions, um, so this is kind of questions philosophy, what is reality made of? What, what is everything? Like when you look at stuff, like this stuff and everything, what, what's inside of it? There gotta be something inside. And remember, they didn't have microscopes back then, never mind anything more sophisticated than that, but they were still wondering, what is this made of? What is knowledge? Note that today we have all these disagreements about knowledge and facts and truth. What is truth? Everybody accuses each other of not um, respecting the truth, um, of lying and so on. Um, but what exactly is it? Is it all matter of opinion? Does any opinion is as good as any other opinion? Or is there actually such thing as the truth? And again, as you will see, more than 2,000 years ago, people were not only wondering about it, but giving pretty good answers to that, uh, which are still relevant for us today. What is justice? Everybody demands justice, right? What exactly is justice? Can you give a definition of justice? What do you think justice is? Can anybody um, say, what, what, what exactly is justice? We often use words and then when we start thinking about them in this way, uh, it becomes hard to explain what it is. When we'll talk about Socrates, Socrates was actually one of the first uh, Greek uh, philosophers, one of the first philosophers cons considered uh, who was doing just that. He was asking questions like that. He would approach people on the streets of Athens and would ask them, what do you think justice is? And most people amazingly thought that they know the answer and they would give him the answer. And then what will happen? He would continue asking them more questions about that and they will figure out that they actually mm -hmm. don't know what it is. Okay, so let me see what you guys are saying. Making right out of wrong situation. Well, that begs the question, what is right and what is wrong? Uh, <laughs> unless you answer that, you kind of have a dead end here. Yeah, um, I say it depends on what you define as a morality and ethics. How do we define those first? And then how do we define justice based on those, um, based on those definitions? Right, so you actually, again, kind of circular a little bit here because we define morality then. Uh, if somebody asks you what justice is um, and you answer, well, it depends on morality, then of course you have to define morality. Otherwise, all you can say is, I don't know. That would be the fair answer. 
Well, yeah, but lots of different. If you look at the dictionary, um, just an English dictionary, most definitions are circular. And we talk about it in philosophy 102. Uh, that, that's what they do. They give you circular definition because they define one words by the other words. But in philosophy, we actually try to dig deeper and understand what it is, even though we're still using words, but really understand what it is. What is it? What justice is? It is very hard to answer. It's enormously hard to answer. And believe it or not, there were different answers given to that. Uh, Plato, in particular, gives one answer in Republic. And when we talk about Republic, uh, week after the next, you will see his answer. But um, many other philosophers disagree with that because, yeah, that's one of the things about philosophy. It's kind of hard to prove this step, right? So one philosopher may give you a very, very good answer, and then another philosopher comes along and disagrees, and there's really no one way to settle this kind of stuff. Can it be determined by laws of different cultures? So suppose some culture has law that you can eat children. So that's justice then? And just, uh, okay, you may think that this is a crazy example. Look at the real example. Look at Nazi Germany. They had laws um, against Jewish population. They were actually killing them. Um, so was it justice then? There's got to be yeah, something I think wrong it, about that. I think it depends on one's personal definition on justice versus the republic's government's definition of justice. But how do you come up with personal definition? So just whatever is good for you, the justice? Good question. Well, we're not going to answer it right now or maybe even ever, but this is just an example of the philosophical questions which we will be dealing with. And note that this is extremely important, isn't it? It's not, it's not a small thing. What justice is is extremely important. It's important today in our society. Uh, it's not just something which crazy Greek people were wondering about 2,000 years ago, it is something we wonder every day. Even if you don't see it there and think about it, uh, you, on some level it affects you. Because obviously, like, look at the, what's going on in this country, look at the riots, for example. That is closely related to this question, isn't it? And obviously it matters hell a lot. So philosophical questions are extremely important. Uh, philosophy itself obviously is a subject, a discipline which tries to answer them. Okay, um, now another thing which you should know is the different areas within philosophy. Because philosophy is, of course, very broad sorry, discipline. Question. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I thought we were going to spend more time on the, the slide that just passed. But, sorry, can you go back to the slide because it has to do something with that and what sure. I just said. So when you asked what justice is, and I just said justice is doing the things the right way, but everyone is different, so what seems right to me is probably wrong to someone else. So I was thinking what you just said, how if someone asks you what justice is, some people say, I don't know, and that could be a valid answer. So this first bullet point on the, the slide, it says, what is reality made of? Mm -hmm. Is reality basically just our own opinion? Like, there is no right or wrong answer to anything then. It's just... Well, you could say, I don't notice anything. No. And something could be right to me, but wrong to you. Is, it, is reality just our own? It, does that make sense? I, don't, I kind of didn't think about that. Okay, let me Before explain it a little bit then. Uh, note that it's talking about reality in terms of what is outside of you. Mm -hmm. Right? So the question here is not how you perceive the reality. The question is what actually is the reality. Like... Take physics. What does physics tell you now? What is reality made of? Atoms. And if you split mm -hmm. atoms, you will find what? Electrons and the nucleus. Well, I don't know if you guys take physics. How much do you know? A nucleus can be split again. This is what they did with the nuclear explosion that has um, neutrons and um, positrons. Then inside of them, there are quarks. Actually, all this elements are made of quarks. Now, what's inside quarks? Uh, maybe you guys watch Big Bang Theory, so you know a little mm -hmm. bit about that. So what do they say may be inside quarks? Does anybody know? Muons, tiles, Higgs bosons, all that kind of jazz. Well, what's the most recent theory? 
they call it string theory. And that's because they think strings, strings are inside of that. Note that it keeps on going. The ultimate question is, what is everything really made of? And some philosophers are actually saying nothing. It's all ideal. There's nothing there. And other philosophers are saying, no, wait a minute, that can't be. There is that some sort of matter, materialism, right? That's what materialism is. They say, no, there, there can't be, it cannot be just an illusion of some sort. There has to be some stuff there, be it strings or whatever other stuff. That's the question about reality. So it's not as much the question about how you perceive the reality. It's a question about the actual reality. And the actual reality has to be made of something, even if it is just your dreams, right? That still is something. Uh, so okay. it, it cannot be completely relative. Now, your perception of reality may depend on your own uh, mind and so on. But whether or not there is actually reality and whether this reality is actually made of something, it's a different question. Okay, so hopefully I explained it. Uh, I try to yes, move, through, move through this stuff a little bit um, uh, quicker because I don't want to miss some of the important stuff. Remember, we are limited in time, right? We are done in 20 minutes, so there's still some stuff to cover. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you have any questions, always stop me and I will try to explain it as well as I can. Okay, uh, so three areas of philosophy. Note that actually there is a question. You, don't, you probably don't have that, but there's a question on that and it will be on the exam too. So that's actually kind of important part. Something you should know, it's on homework too. Um, so this is the three primary areas we can uh, divide philosophy. There's more than these three, and actually book for some reason says there's four, it brings another one, uh, but the homework only has three. So this is the three primary ones. Epistemology. Epistemology comes from a Greek word episteme, which is to know. And this is why it's theory of knowledge. Number two, metaphysics. Metaphysics is the theory of reality. The questions of what's ultimately real, that's kind of metaphysical question. Um, it's closely related to physics, but it looks at the subjects deeper than physics does. Then there's ethics. Ethics deals with questions of morality. So just to go a little bit deeper, let's look at epistemology first. Epistemology theory of truth or knowledge. Typical questions epistemology looks at are what is truth? When somebody says, it is true that there is a dog in that apartment next to me, what do they exactly mean? Can it be relative? Well, what do you think? Can it be relative? Well, I, I have an apartment right there, right? If I say there is a dog there, can it be like, well, there's dog for me, but there's no dog for you? What do you guys think? Is it possible? Well, no, this is not possible because it's a question of fact. As we will later talk about it, the questions of fact, we do say they actually are true or false. There is another thing which is um, something, value judgments, something called value judgments. We go into more detail about that in Philosophy 102, but just to give you an idea. Value judgments are that something is good, bad, better, worse, more important or less important than some other thing. Now that obviously is subjective. If I'm saying, oh, this is such a good, um, I don't know, soup, obviously you can disagree. You can say, oh, I tasted that and it is horrible. And there's no way for us to settle it because if it's good for me, it may very well be bad for you, right? That but would be the, subjective, right? Professor? Yeah, yeah. But the questions of fact, such as whether there is a dog in that apartment right there, they are not relative and they are not subjective. You cannot say, oh, okay, you believe there is a dog and I don't believe. And again, if we look at the, for example, current affairs, these elections, right? And some people are saying there was this mass scale fraud and other people say there wasn't. Well, it's not subjective. There either was or there wasn't mass scale fraud which affected it. Right? So it's not like, oh, it is for me, but it's not for you. It is a matter of fact. And the fact is something which um, is there and it's not dependent on people. But what is the problem with facts? 
How do we know? How do we know there was mass scale fraud? What Donald Trump tell us, tells us there was, should we trust him? Or should we trust other people? Note that in that case, from the question of fact, we're going into the question of belief. We're going by, do we believe this person? So going back to the example with the dog, how would I know that there's a dog in the apartment next to mine? One way for me to know would be, I heard somebody barking there. Could I be wrong? You could be. Just because you heard barking doesn't necessarily mean that the dog is there. Definitely. I mean, what if they watch TV and there's barking on TV every day? I don't know. They watch films about you know dogs. Present example. Um, suppose somebody told me, like the neighbor told me, they have a dog there. Again, could I be wrong? If I have... If I say to you, I have knowledge now that there is a dog. Well, it's less likely, but it is still likely. Why? Maybe he is wrong. Maybe he is confused. Maybe he's got his facts wrong, right? What is the best way for me to find out? Well, obviously, the best way for me to find out is to go there, knock on their door, and check it for myself. But note that the problem in life is very few things we can check for ourselves. Most things we learn from other people, on the authority of other people, be it media, social networks, and so on. Uh, even some things which seem so, like, you know, common sense and natural, um, we learn from other people. And so that, even though it is a question of fact, but it's closely connected to our knowledge. How do we know that? What evidence do we have to support this particular uh, conclusion which we draw right and that is quite complicated and again that goes into more detail of that in philosophy 102 we will not talk as much about it but this is what epistemology is concerned with the questions of truth knowledge what can we even know for example can we know that there is god or not it is kind of epistemological question because there may be answer to this, we can never know. We cannot know. Maybe there is God, maybe there isn't. Or some people are saying, no, we can know it and we can prove it. And you will see that um, some philosophers, Thomas Aquinas in particular, who we will cover, actually said that uh, he presented proofs of the existence of God. He said, we can prove it logically. We can use logic and prove that there is God. So this is the, again, type of epistemological question. Now, metaphysics, of course, is um, somewhat more um, speculative in that sense. Okay, little discussion now. So, based on your own educational experience, did you redo the reading? If you did, can you analyze James Q. Wilson's claim that radical relativism is rampant on college campuses? Know that you can only answer that. Well, you can probably answer it even if you didn't do the reading. But if you did do the reading, you know what I'm talking about. There is actually a big quote there. Um, about that. So what do you guys think? Radical relativism. Yeah, that I for the future I definitely would advise you do the reading before we discuss it. It helps a lot. Even though it's not impossible to discuss it without the reading, but it just helps you. Well, just briefly to tell you what he's talking about. Uh, because his students approach him all the time and tell to him that, you know, it's all kind of relative uh, this kind of radical relativism and there's really no such thing as the truth. That's basically um, kind of a thing you hear more and more from students. Everything is a matter of opinion. So yeah, unfortunately that does happen more and more. Although I can't say that I had students approach me and tell me this, um, but I'm sure some students are thinking that. Probably not as much at CSN. By the way, um, again, CSN is maybe a little different in that sense. When you go to like um, East Coast, Yale, Harvard, all these um, kind of colleges, students there are generally more, um, you know, speculative. They think they know everything. So they kind of have more, more opinionated, I would say. <laughs> the smarter somebody thinks um, he or she is, the uh, more opinionated they become. And in that sense, it's kind of difficult to, uh, even for professors to talk to them because they, um, 
think they know things better than professor. So that 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 is in in a lot of ways um, where uh, this James Wilson comes from, because professors often describe this type of experience when they talk to students and students just tell them, you know what, I disagree. Uh, I don't think so. And who are you to tell me? Uh, I know you're a professor, but so what? Um, I have my own opinion. Every opinion is as good as another. Note that um, there is a pretty good answer to that, which again the reading kind of mentions. And that um, answer goes back all the way to Plato. And the answer goes like this. If every opinion is as good as any other opinion, and no opinion is any better of it, then opinion that everything is relative is also just an opinion. So you cannot say it is true. Do you guys see what I mean? So for example, if you tell me that all opinions are equal and there is no truth, and I tell you that there is truth, you cannot say that you are right and I am wrong because you are the one who say in all opinions are equal and there is no true opinion. So relativism is kind of self-defeating in that sense. If all opinions are equal, then the opinion that all opinions are equal is also just an opinion. Okay. <laughs> Okay, anyway, um, so let's look at uh, metaphysics now. Metaphysics is kind of a, a more speculative type of philosophy. Why is it called metaphysics? It's actually a kind of interesting historical curiosity. I talked about it a little bit in the video. Uh, the book by Aristotle called Physics was right before the book which went into this subject. Uh, he called this book himself first philosophy. He said it's the first philosophy of philosophy of existence and being. But the uh, person who was kind of editing his work about 300 years after he died decided that since it goes after physics, it makes sense to call it after physics, which in Greek is metaphysics. And since then it kind of picked up and today we call this subject metaphysics. Metaphysics looks at the questions uh, kind of connected to religious kind of questions. Uh, why does something exist instead of nothing? How did the world begin? Note that this is questions is very difficult to answer for us. But as human beings, we can't help but wonder about it. What is the fundamental underlying, underlying nature of reality? Again, this is a metaphysical question. Physics does tell us a lot of things about it, but physics cannot answer all of them. For example, string theory is just a theory. What does it mean? Well, they cannot prove it. Because in order to prove it, you actually have to get to that level. And what are you going to do it with? Uh, are you going to have this teeny tiny, um, I don't know, knife to cut the uh, quarks in half and find out whether there's strings inside of them? No, because what will it be made of? So they kind of speculate about it based on science, based on the knowledge they have. Nonetheless, it is a theory because they can be wrong. It looks like um, it's a fair um, assessment based on the knowledge and they conduct in all sorts of experiments trying to get some sort of um, confirmation for that. But nonetheless, they could uh, very well be wrong. There are other theories, competing theories and so on. But um, in metaphysics, you could actually, you are allowed to speculate. You are allowed to say something like, well, how about there is nothing there? Like the reality is literally made of nothing. What does it mean? Well, maybe... Uh, have you seen movie Matrix? We will mention it more than once. But if you've seen movie Matrix, you kind of have an idea what I'm talking about. Uh, what was the reality in Matrix? Okay, well, okay, let me tell you. Um, they, it's it was simulated. They were uh, swimming in some sort of liquid with stuff attached to their heads, and this stuff was feeding into their brain the picture of the world. And they thought they actually live in this world. So when this main character um, 
gets a choice of two pills, a red one and a blue one, and he chooses that, um, what was it, blue one, I think, he swallows it, he wakes up. He actually wakes up and discovers himself swimming in this liquid. And that is the reality. But the world he thought was the reality was just a simulation. So some philosophers are saying everything is like that. There's actually no liquid, but it's all just a simulation. When we think the world exists, there's actually no world. No world. Yeah, it's kind of a type of virtual reality. Um, so if we split everything and find out what is there, we'll find nothing because there's nothing there. That's part of metaphysics. That's just to give you an idea what metaphysics is. Um, it also wonders about the, do abstract entities such as numbers and properties exist? Is there such thing as number two? Or is it just a mental construction? Do What types of entities or objects exist and what are their characteristics and so on? Metaphysical questions, again, like I said, generally are considered um, speculative. And for this reason, some philosophers even say that this whole area is just nothing but a bunch of speculation. I actually am not very good with anime. I can't, I can't tell you about that. But maybe somebody else can answer. Ethics. Now, ethics is the third major area. And this is the theory of virtue and morality. This is where we ask questions such as what is right or wrong? Are some actions inherently right or wrong or are actions right or wrong based on their consequences? What does it mean? Well, inherently, as in there is such thing as murder is wrong always under any circumstances. Well, typically people would say because it says so in the Bible, because God gave us commandments or something like that. And other people are saying, no, 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 there is no God. There is no commandments. The murder is simply wrong because, well, we don't want to be murdered, right? So based on consequences of that, we don't want people murdering each other. So we are saying it is wrong to commit a murder. But we don't mean that there is actually such a law of nature. We are just saying, as human beings, we agree among each other that we don't think murdering each other is a good idea. That's probably not a good idea. Because maybe I want to murder somebody, and we all sometimes kind of do, right? But I don't want to be murdered myself. And I don't want those near and dear to me to be murdered either. So for this reason, how about we don't murder anybody? And that's basically how we determine what is right and wrong, based on consequences. Uh, similarly with theft. Like, maybe I would like to go and take something which I like, but I don't want it to be taken from me. If somebody comes and takes it from me, that's not going to be very good. And so based on that, we decide, how about nobody takes anything unless, you know, they buy it. That's the only way we transfer property. Or if it's a gift. But you cannot just take other people's stuff. It's private property. You cannot touch it. So again, is there such thing as the fundamental law of nature here? Or are we just agreeing based on consequences? Know that lately, it, in history, we are tending more towards the idea that it's all just based on consequences. But it wasn't always like this. During the medieval days, a lot of people, majority of people are very religious, so they actually thought that this is the law of nature. And these laws are given to us by God. So still some people believe it today, but not as many. Back then, pretty much everybody believed it. So that's... A legitimate question. Okay, and um, then philosophy has a lot of um, kind of an other branches, which are kind of some divisions, right? So this is the three major ones. Um, in particular, the book also talks about philosoph political philosophy and philosophy of um, social and political philosophy as the fourth one. It's a question whether it's a fourth one. Um, in homework, you will see it uh, this way. So philosophy of mind, logic, which is philosophy 102, philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of religion, philosophy of education. They are kind of a smaller subdivisions of the ones we talked about right now. So um, if you are interested in any of these particular ones, UNLV has um, special subject classes on pretty much all of them, philosophy of law and so on. Um, at CSN, we don't teach them because they go too, they're too specialized. But this is like usually 300 level, 400 level classes. Um, 
Okay, uh, we do, however, have logic. Logic is philosophy 102. Critical thinking or logic. Uh, that's one of these classes uh, which you can take at CSN. And again, some of you did take it with me. Um, others maybe will take it in the future with me or with other professors. Logic comes from Greek, again, ancient Greek word logike. And we will talk a little bit more about um, this word or the related word logos, which originally meant the word of what is spoken. So it actually is very closely connected to arguments. How do we construct arguments? Why um, we can't just, you know, keep on talking? Why do we need to? This is my cat, by the way, in case you wonder. Woke up and said hello. He will appear periodically. Anyway, um, why? What is a good argument? What is a bad argument? Why are some arguments better than others? This is also part of philosophy. Aristotle was one of the first who actually uh, came up with the rules of logic and then philosophy 102, mainly based around uh, the rules which Aristotle himself discovered. When we talk about Aristotle, we will briefly mention it, but uh, details of logic um, is something you will find in philosophy 102, not in this class. In this class, we will talk a little bit about all these subjects, including metaphysics, epistemology, and so on. So again, it uh, deals with arguments, it deals with inferences, and valid reasoning. Why is some reasoning valid, other reasoning is not valid? Note that I'm going into a little bit of a detail on that, because that's actually one more question on the review. It is something you need to know for the final exam, for the next exam. Political philosophy, whether it's a major branch, I don't know. This is the kind of philosophy which talks about ideal political state, uh, purpose of the state, and so on. It um, goes deeper than, let's say, political science. If you take political science, you'll be talking about the existing system, uh, like the American Constitution and so on. In political philosophy, we look deeper. We look at the questions, well, is there ideal state? How do we make the ideal state? Can we improve it uh, even more? Should we even have government? And if we do, what's the best kind of government? Should we have a republic? Should we have a um, autocracy or something? This is kind of questions of political philosophy. And philosophy of religion. Okay, it looks like we are running out of time. That is always a, a little bit of a risk. So let me just um, wrap it up a little bit. Um, all this stuff depends on your personal worldview. Different people have different worldviews. Of course, on many of it, we may never agree. Nonetheless, if you use uh, rules of reasoning, if you approach it systematically, you can learn quite a bit about yourself and about the world around you, which is what we will be doing in this class, hopefully. Reason and argumentation is very important in philosophy. That's why Again, logic started with um, in philosophy, and that's why we should still observe it when we are doing philosophy. And this class is going historically. There are different ways to actually do it. You can go by subject, like epistemology, and then talk about all the philosophers and what did they say about theory of knowledge, metaphysics, again. But in our class, we'll be going historically from the beginning of philosophy and then all the way to modern days. This is how the book goes, this is how um, I prefer to do it, and I think it's a very good approach, because it actually um, shows you how our, as a society, understanding of ourselves and the world around us evolved with history, because there is a close connection. Obviously, the way we do philosophy is connected to the way we live our lives. So based on, to put it bluntly, whether you live in a cave and hide bison or whether you live in a modern house and watch, um, I don't know, Fox News or something, your philosophy will be very different too. Okay, anyway, um, so this is what you will see in the book as well, learning objectives. Um, we tried to cover them today, we obviously didn't, but um, it's all in the reading. Please do those readings. They will kind of go over all these points. Um, and finally, just to sum it up for you, what you need to do. So again, 
for um, next week. Overview of classical themes, that's kind of a short reading, it just tells you, introduces you to the um, first few chapters of the book, which deal with classical philosophy, classical Greek philosophy. It has this learning objective, which is kind of a list like this, and it tells you what you really should be looking for there. And then you need to read the chapter two. This is the readings which are there, okay? Um, and then there is this homework, like I said, this Sunday, there's only two of them, Introduction to Using Aplia and Introduction to Philosophy. This is the two homeworks you need to do by midnight, Sunday to Monday. They are graded. If you don't do it by midnight, Sunday to Monday, they'll be zero. I know many students already did it, but just to remind you, this is the deadline, January 24th, 11.59 p.m. Make sure you do it by then. Okay, so this is all the time we have. Are there any questions? All right, you can always message me. I'll try to answer as soon as I can. Otherwise, we're all done for today. I will put up this video online if you want to watch it again or for whatever other reason. If you missed it, you can always watch it online. Um, it will also be available on Canvas. So either way, you can access it later. And with that, this is all we have. So see you on Monday, 2 o'clock. And make sure you do all this stuff. And um, have a great weekend. Bye, guys.